Hi, this is Al Souza. Some of you know me as Fuzzy Pup on Full Tilt Poker or Card Runners. Uh, I've been playing six and a half years, and uh, more of my games than not are in live play, not online. Um, so the study of this video will be on discipline and psychology, not the mathematical parts of poker. I call it the Kung Fu of poker because in martial arts you do require a lot of discipline to train yourself and to get good. When I look at poker, I look at poker as a poker pyramid, uh, which is the most important part being discipline at the bottom. Uh, discipline involves training that develops your self-control, character, orderliness, and efficiency. Uh, mathematics is understanding the probability, equity, game theory, and optimal play. Psychology is the study of mental processes and behavior. That is the middle section of poker. At the top is luck, which uh, over the lifespan of a poker player's career doesn't impact as much as you think, only about 1.5%. We will be focusing on discipline and psychology of the game. So most of this video is going to apply to online play for the psychological part. Discipline. I like this quote. Um, Without self-discipline, success is impossible. Period. I find that very true in poker and in life. When you're playing, have a proper bankroll. 50 to 100 buy-ins is what I find uh, is a good recommendation. Uh, it removes money fear. So if you lose two or three or four stacks and you have a very unlucky day, it doesn't phase you. Um, allows you to play your limit comfortably without worry. Uh, and allows you to handle down swings. The smaller your bankroll is, the more variance you're going to have. And the more your bankroll is going to go up and down and create stress on yourself. Lower your stakes if you don't have enough of a, of a uh, bankroll. Play stakes where you feel comfortable getting it in. If you have any fear about getting your stack in, then you're playing too high of a limit. Table selection. This is somewhere where I find a lot of regulars um, do not do very well. Select tables where you're going to make the most money because the money rotates clockwise around the table. You want loose players on your right and tight players on your left. When you have loose players on your right, they play more hands, thus you could play more hands in position versus them. When you have tight players on your left, they play less hands, you could steer their blinds more, and because they play less hands, you are not involved in as many pots with them, so you lose less to them. Also, I think tighter players are usually a little bit more predictable. Do not have aggressive players on your left. Uh, those can give you headaches, make you tighten your range, play differently. Um, you can't take advantage of the bad players on your right as much because they might be three-betting you or calling your raises and playing position on you often. If a table gets too tough, just leave. Your ego has nothing to do with it. I know I leave a lot of tables when I play online and even live. If I say if I see there is a tough opponent to my left, I get out and I move to another move to another table. There's plenty of other tables to choose from. Another one that I see um, a lot of players doing is know your limits on the number of tables you can play simultaneously. Tighter players can generally play more tables than looser ones. Uh, there are exceptions to the rule, of course. There are some people that are just brilliant and can play 15 tables and play a lot of hands. But know your limit on the number of tables. Once you start going over that limit, you put undue stress on your brain and it lowers your win rate and it lowers your win weight pretty fast as you increase the number of tables. Try to keep the same sight with the with aligned tables. This allows your eyes to read them very quickly and very fast. If you have full tail poker tables up and poker star table up and a carbon poker table up, you are looking at three different designs, three different visual aspects, and your eyes have to adjust every time you look at a different looking table. So try to keep the same sight when you're playing. We're going to move on to combating tilt. Mentally and physically prepare yourself for playing. Be sure you feel well mentally and physically. Have a positive and calm state of mind. One thing that I like to do before I play is maybe exercise and watch something that is puts me in a good state of mind, like America's Funniest Video, or a comedy show. Try not to watch the news. It's very depressing. Try not to watch something sad or upsetting. Um, that will impact your play. Play without fear. Fear is a form of tilt. And that also goes back to money fear. Watch for signs of poor play. If you feel yourself playing badly or you start seeing yourself make mistakes, take a break or quit, depending on what your emotional status is. Or if you don't feel well, take a break or quit. And either try to fix it, get it out of your system, but stop what you're doing right there. If you are getting lucky, do not get overconfident and start playing more and more hands. The only reason why you would play more hands 
is for table dynamics, not because you're getting lucky. I have seen in live games people that start getting lucky, and they start getting overconfident and overplaying their hands and making bold moves and bold bluffs, and they eventually lose all their stack. Understand that bad beats are part of the game, and that's the one weapon that bad players have against us. If they do not get lucky every once in a while, we would never have anybody playing. Hand play. Learn techniques from others and adapt them to your own style. Don't try to mimic somebody else's style. Take what's best about theirs and incorporate it into your own, or take what's, what works from theirs that will be good in your own style. Take time during a hand to make the correct decision. This is very important. I find taking an extra couple seconds, two or three seconds during a hand, or even ten seconds, allows me to make better decisions because the whole game is about decisions. Try to play position as much as possible. This keeps decisions easy. This keeps less stress on you. Now, there are going to be some situations where it's more um, optimal to play a hand not easy, where you will extract more value from an opponent by making it difficult on yourself to play. Uh, those are rare exceptions, but they do happen. Um, adjust the table dynamics, because poker is very fluid. Computers have learned how to beat checkers, how to beat chess, how to beat limit poker. They have not learned how to beat no limit poker. This is how fluid that kind of game is. So you always have to adjust. Adjust pre-flop your hand ranges, adjust post-flop to who's in the hand. If you play a live game, keep your physical actions the same on every hand. Try to develop a robotic type style. Now, the last one is a little bit hard to review sometimes, reviewing your decisions before executing them and making sure they're absolutely right. They kind of go with uh, taking your time during the hand. Focus. Uh, I think this is something a lot of people are guilty of not doing it properly. Removing distractions. If you play online, do not watch TV, do not use your instant messenger, internet surfing, or have other people talking to you or coming in and out of your room or your office. Um, you have to have complete focus when playing online, especially if you multi-table. If you're at a live game, don't watch the TVs in the casino. Don't do reading. Don't do dreaming. Don't watch the opposite sex as they walk by. And do not get in opinionated talks about religion or philosophy or the news or politics. That only takes away from where your brain should be focusing on. One thing I like to do at a live game is wear a visor. That way... It covers everything above me. I don't see TVs or lights or people walking by. I just focus on the players at the table and the table itself. Uh, do not play in physical discomfort. If you have a headache or intestinal discomfort, take care of it. Or if you can't take care of it, stop playing. Play when you only feel physically and mentally well. Now, you might see me repeat this several times during the video, but this is of key importance to people, and I think a lot of players don't do this. Be comfortable when playing. Make sure that you're not in pain. Make sure that you have a good chair. Make sure that the environment you're in is uh, relaxing. If you listen to music, listen to relaxing music. Don't listen to something that is very high strung that will get you excited. You do not want that. You want relaxing music. Have a good proper equipment. If you play online, have a good computer that can handle everything that's going on, all the software that you have open. Have a nice comfortable chair, a good desk, a good sharp monitor that will not hurt your eyes, an LCD is highly recommended, and a mouse. Also for your monitor, have a big monitor. That way you could see all the information on the screen a lot easier. If you are playing live, have a notepad to take notes. Have good snacks. A sweater, because there are some casinos that are cold. Um, bring water. Have glasses if you wear sunglasses at the table, and wear a visor. Uh, when you study, study with books, videos, articles, discussions, and forums. Pretty much everything that you could possibly get your hands on. Even if something, uh, and this applies mostly to books, uh, if a book is not that good, they will usually have a section that's actually pretty good and can apply to your game. I've read over 45 books, and there have been quite a few that have not been good, and um, but I still got something out of them. Critically and objectively think about your play. This goes for everything. Think outside the box. Look beyond you know, this is a bad hand, I shouldn't be playing it this way. Well, why aren't, why is it a bad hand to play? Maybe there's something that you're doing wrong. Maybe it's the table dynamics that you're at. Um, think about these things and incorporate them into your play. Nutrition. This is unbelievably important and a lot of people do not realize this. The younger you are, the less it impacts you, but it does impact you. The older you are, the more it will impact you. Your physical well-being directly affects your mental well-being. Foods to eat. You want to focus on whole grains, 
non-starchy vegetables, chickens, nuts. Nuts are actually an excellent snack food. Almonds are the best. They're, they're pretty much the ultimate food. Walnuts are the worst of the nuts, but they are still good for you. Wild salmon, bake or cook with extra virgin olive oil. These type of foods contain car complex carbohydrates, monounsaturated fats, high quality protein, and omega-3 fatty acids. <coughs> foods to avoid. You want to avoid any food that's white. White bread, white rice, white pasta. You definitely want to avoid fast food, high fat foods and high fat meats, milk, junk food, snacks, pizza, desserts, and butter. These kind of foods contain simple carbohydrates, polyunsaturated fats, saturated fats, trans fats, additives, and sugar like corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, refined or processed sugar. Some sensible substitutes if you like sugar are agave, whole grain snacks, almond milk, baked nut fried, and extra virgin olive oil when cooking. And this, these are the reasons why. This is the good and the bad of the two. We'll start with the good. Complex carbohydrates are like time release capsule of, of energy. What happens is when you take a complex carbohydrate, your body takes it in and it looks at it. It's almost like a puzzle. It's a very complex puzzle and it takes time to break it down. What this means is that the energy stored in it gets released very, very slowly. So you have a nice steady, even pace of energy fueling you. Monounsaturated fats create cell membranes and it helps neurons. It basically helps your brain be better. So any way I could put it uh, without getting technical. Polyunsaturated fats, uh, you want to ingest these naturally occurring and not processed. I've read a lot on this and I haven't gotten a super solid answer, but they are necessary for your diet as long as you take them naturally. Omega-3 increases the transmission of brain signals in your brain. Uh, that is found in wild salmon, actually, and that is the best kind of fish that you can have for your brain. Protein are the building blocks of your brain's networks. Very important to have protein like chicken. Um, water or V8 should be used as your drink over anything else. V8 because it contains a lot of vegetables, and water because water is just good for your brain. Try not to have things like Gatorade or Powerade um, or sodas. That, that is just awful. Uh, that's pure sugar and additives. The bad. Simple carbohydrates are like an injection of sugar causing an insulin spike and crash. Now what this does is while your body gets an immediately jolt of energy, your body starts producing insulin to counteract it. And uh, the insulin actually causes the sugar from affecting your brain and actually forces you, uh, not, uh, forces you to go to sleep. If you ever have, let's say... Um, a lot of fast food and you feel sleepy afterwards, this is one of the reasons. Your brain actually needs sugar, but it needs like a slow ingestion of it, not a quick spike. Because your own body will react to the quick spike and prevent that sugar from affecting your brain. Saturated fats slow down the brain and they're, they're just unnecessary for diet. And this is McDonald's, Burger King, um, high fat meats. Trans fats blocks blood flow, disrupts communication in brain cells. Again, this is just horrific for your brain. You want your brain to be as efficient as possible. Additives. We don't know the exact impacts of additives on the brain. Um, I should suggest don't have it. If you can, try to eat organic or try to at least eat natural foods. Um, uh, look at the nutrition label on the back of anything that you eat. If it has a lot of chemicals in it, a lot of preservatives, a lot of additives, just don't eat it. Get something else. And alcohol isn't obvious. It converts straight to sugar and affects your judgment. So now you're getting the differences between the two. One is good for you. The good is good for your brain. It makes you process faster, makes you think faster, makes you have better memory, and builds good cells in your brain. The other one simply does not. It, it slows down your brain. It doesn't make it work as well. I have personally tried eating bad before a game and tried eating good, and I notice the difference. I notice the difference severely. It impacts the way I think uh, on a tremendous level. Exercise and sleep. How much and how often? Generally, for somebody that has a normal life, I would say 30 minutes, 30 minutes a day, three times a week. Uh, this is what most doctors tell me. Um, but this depends uh, on how your life is. If you sit around all day and watch TV after you play poker, uh, then I suggest uh, maybe you increase this amount of exercise. Uh, if you're very active, and very active means, let's say, you work in the yard or you work on your garden or you play tennis or you play some other type of sport recreationally, then you don't need it as much. Uh, light workouts and walking and light muscle strengthening is all you need. You don't need to be bulking up.
You just need to keep your body fit. Exercise does your body very well. It produces good chemicals that are actually good for your brain that make you think better and keep you in a good mood. Sleep seven to nine hours a night or whatever your body requires. Personally, I only require seven. My wife requires 11. That's just her. And below is the impact of proper sleep and exercise. It improves your brain functions. It also reduces stress, keeps you physically healthy and alert, increases stamina, and produces a good chemicals in your body that lead to a positive attitude. Uh, the increased stamina part mostly applies to live games because some of the larger multi-table tournaments um, that can go on for days, you require a tremendous amount of stamina to stay within those immense events and uh, stay alert. And exercise really does help that. So here we're going to cover a quick summary of the discipline. Uh, bankroll, have proper bankroll to play the limit that you're at. If you don't, drop. Drop down a limit until you feel comfortable. Table selection, you want loose players on your right, tight players on your left. Um, pick good tables. Combating tilt, realize when you're on tilt. Uh, leave or take a break when you feel that you're playing badly. Hand play, use the correct decision process. Take time on your decisions. Um, try to play hands easy. Try to play hands in position. Uh, focus, no distractions, absolutely none. When you're playing live or online, try to keep a positive mental state and attitude, healthy physical state, and study and critically think about what you're studying. Uh, nutrition, know the good and the bad. One thing I'm going to tell you about nutrition, when you look at labels of foods, the first ingredient is the most important. If the first ingredient does not say whole grain, it is not whole grain. It is a very tiny portion of whole grain. If it says something else and then whole grain, that's not whole grain. Whenever you pick whole grain foods, you want to pick the food that the very first ingredient says whole grain. That You know you are getting more than 50% of that product is going to be that good whole grain. Whole grain is very important to your diet, and it is one of the biggest impactors on my performance that I have seen ever since I switched. Make sure you exercise enough. Make sure you sleep enough, and it, uh, sleep enough, and it varies between individuals. Some people need more. Some people need less. Know what you need. Um, what I suggest for everybody is test yourself. Try different things. Try eating well. Try eating bad. Try sleeping different uh, hours. Try exercising different amounts. And keep track of how you feel when you play. And really be introspective and think about what's going on inside your head and your body and find out what the optimal solution on is for you. Even when you do play, find out what your time limit is. Some people have a time limit to play. I play in 90-minute sessions when I play online because I start dozing off, I started going off in other directions when I play. So I take a break after 90 minutes. Find out what your limit is. Now we're going to hit the psychology part of this. Do not underestimate its importance. This mostly applies to live game. I would say 97% of the time and very, very little in online games. Um, the quote I like is, uh, the smarter you play, the luckier you'll be. And in live games, I think that applies uh, quite a bit. General effects of psychology. Psychology affects live games much more than online games. Um, the stronger the player, the less he reveals and the less he tilts. Larger stacks are psychologically intimidating. Uh, players play more attention to those they don't like. Players that like you will play more predictably. Players that don't like you will play more unpredictably. And this can be good and bad. Uh, when under stress, people tend to spend more money. This is actually a study that I saw to be true. When people are depressed and upset, they tend to spend more money. Which means at the table, in general, somebody that is not happy will tend to call your bluffs more. But this does not mean that is always true. You will have other players that do the reverse form, where they will fold more. Um, in most cases, don't bluff a stressed player they will call. Winning players gain confidence and become bolder. This, this is that form of tilt that I was talking about, that when you keep getting lucky and winning, and mostly applies to bad players, um, they start getting bolder and doing more actions and playing more hands and betting more and calling more. Um, all factors add up and amplify. This is important also. Every little thing that happens psychologically to a player will just keep adding up and adding up and adding up. We're going to target online poker, poker first since there's very little on it. A uh, few of the hands played online involve psychology, but uh, some things I found to be true. Quick decisions usually mean something, even in sequence. Um, I have actually found, and this does not happen often, if I see a person just uh, quickly bet the flop, quickly bet the turn, quickly bet the river, they're not thinking about their hand, that means whatever they're doing is completely pre-planned. 
Um, and I have found more times than not these type of players are bluffing. Um, but this I only apply usually to bad players. Uh, the good players can trick you with all sorts of, of betting styles and patterns and quicknesses. Um, Multi-tabling players will generally bluff less. This means if somebody's playing 16 tables and he's playing really tight when he raises you, it is very unlikely that he's bluffing you. Uh, he's just not paying attention enough to that one table uh, to say, I'm going to bluff this guy this hand. Uh, this, the next one is kind of unusual, and I'm not sure if somebody will agree with me or not, but I have found this to be true. Chat box usage can get players to call or fold. Um, when people are in a debate situation, they start thinking about their head what they should do. They don't know. They always have a default function that they will perform. ID players who tend to fold or call where chat will snap that decision. Where if uh, you want, you know, whatever decision their default play is, if you could type something in there, say you're going to call or you're not, or I guess you don't have a good hand, whatever it is that you do, that'll snap that decision usually and make them do their default action. Um, what I like to do in this situation, and this is, of course, not all the time, but if there's a decision where I don't mind a call, but I prefer a fold, that's when I'll, that's when I'll say something in a chat box. But I don't do that very often. Uh, forums are a very good way to get a read on a player. If you are seeing a particular poster, post uh, hand poster, or even responses, um, and you start identifying long-term streaks like winning or losing, they're posting up their thing, they're having, they're posting up their uh, poker tracker or their holder manager. If they're having trouble, you see a lot of stress in their post, and you know who that person is online, then you got a target on them, and you know by their mental state how they're playing, and you can take advantage of it. Um, but that's about it. And um, I would think uh, going over form and trying to really identify people, if you could do it quickly, that's good. Uh, but don't spend a ton of time on it. I think you'll make more money just playing online and playing your normal game. <clears throat> Live poker pregame. This is where the majority of the focus of psychology comes in. Uh, many of the hands played live may involve psychology. So, have enough money to cover all players in a cash game. If you have a big stack, it's just intimidating, period. End of story. Uh, this applies to cash games, of course. Take notes on breaks or after session. Have a small notebook. This is important. When you take notes, it reinforces your brain and reinforces your reads on players. Just don't try to memorize it. Take notes of who they are. Write a description on them or their names if you can remember their names. Think about how you think. If you're a listener, if you're a visual learner, so write key things that will help you remember how they play. Um, every form of method that you do to teach yourself from experiencing it, from reading it, from listening to it, from teaching others will only build your memory for that function. Arrive early at a live game or a multi-table tournament. Determine the other player's mental, mental states. Figure out who's in a good mood, who's not, who just won last night, who didn't win, um, who's in a bad mood. Listen to their bad beat stories. Just listen, ask questions, ask questions about them. You will get so much insight on their play. You will see how they think about hands. You know, if they start describing you this, and you're just like, well, why didn't you do this? You know, why didn't you fold? Why didn't you call? You'll get an insight to their game. Remember, People love, absolutely love talking about themselves. Now, for you, do not talk about your problems, do not talk about strategy, and do not talk about you playing online because that'll only make people very wary of you. Um, if you play online, they're like, oh, this guy's a pro. Uh, so do not talk about that. You don't play online or you play online recreationally. Keep yourself very distanced from the strategies. Um, in fact, I would even try to suggest not talking about yourself that much. Anything that you give away, uh, is information for the players. Play as long as the game is good for you and as long as that you're feeling well and you're mentally well, of course, just like I mentioned before. Uh, don't play a cash game during a multi-day MTT. If you're playing in the World Series of Poker and uh, your day's over, don't go to the cash game tables and play. It'll affect your mood for the next day. It'll affect you physically the next day because you're stressing your brain out over a gargantuan period of time. Make sure you get enough sleep. If you, if you play in a World Series event, or multi-table, uh, multi-day tournament, stop at the end of the day, go do something else, you need to relax. That was a tough day. MTTs are not, are not easy to lie. There's a lot of stuff that you have to focus on. So take a break. Okay, at the live table. Playing only one table means that people notice the action. They notice what you're doing. They notice how you're playing. This is not online. There's not 20 tables open and people play multiple tables. Um, Bad players online will be doing a hundred other things. Bad player at a live table will be talking to different people, but they will still notice what you're doing. Your luck can be 
exponentially multiplied within their minds. Um, I have found this to be unbelievably true. If you are winning at a table, you can get away with a lot more. And be sure people know that you are lucky, especially bad players, because it does affect their mental state. If you win a hand, you're just like, well, must be my lucky night. Um, keep reinforcing this. Reinforce this behavior because they will think you're lucky. They will play much more predictable if they think you're lucky. Now, the reverse is true. If you are getting unlucky, if you're getting bad beat to hell and back, don't say anything. Just keep positive. You do not want them to realize that you're having an unlucky night because now they will start playing unpredictably at you. They will try to bluff you more. They will try to call you down more. They will play in a style that you are not accustomed to, and then you have to readjust, which will take time, and it is much slower at a live game than online. Watch, listen, and then look at the board. The most important thing you could do at a live game is not look at the flop. Look at the players. Observe the players. Watch what they do. Watch how they react. If you have to choose where to look, look to your left because those players have positions on position on you the players to your right they'll play a little bit more predictably especially let's say if you're on the hijack or the cutoff players on your right are not going to be fooling around that much but the players on your left will uh, you'll notice different things they do and you can adjust uh, accordingly stay quiet during a hand unless you have the last action don't say anything um, if last action means if somebody bets into you and your decision is you're going to put it you're going to put it all in or you're not or you're going to call or not or or, uh, uh, or you want to know information about them. That's the only time you should be talking. Take your time on decisions. This is live, this is live game. You don't have a little timer there. Take as much time as you want. So do not let other players intimidate you. There might be some other players at the table that will try to say, hey, come on, hurry up. You know, keep the poker game moving. Don't let them intimidate you. Take as much time as you like. When you are winning, stay quiet. Don't gloat. Don't say anything. Just stay quiet and take your winnings. When you're losing, make jokes. Be positive. Be humorous. That keeps, you know, it, it, it's good for you. It's good for your mental state, and it keeps people liking you. This is the way I think about when I'm at a live game, especially a cash game. You are like a casino. You are there to entertain the casual players that want to have fun. And in turn, they will pay you to be entertained. If you upset a bad player, if you berate him, you are teaching him. If you insult him, you make him want to go away. Why would anybody want to sit at a table with somebody that's insulting them? That casual player in the Hawaiian shirt is there to have a good time. And the more you entertain this guy, the more jokes you stay, the more jokes you say, the more he'll want to stay. If he's losing and you have shown him an entertaining time and he's thinking about getting up or staying, he will stay. Simple as that. Live table persona. Now, this is something that I see in, um, uh, on TV, a lot of the uh, TV events I watch for poker, and I've seen it at a lot of the tables. Um, usually this applies to professionals, uh, not, to, uh, not to other type of players. Um, I generally see three different types of persona. The friendly persona, which is Daniel DeGranu. Um, he, you just got to like him. He's just such a great guy, and that's the type of person that can get away with this. If you are one of these type of people that are naturally liked by everybody, you might want to consider just naturally being yourself and naturally being friendly. But the intimidating type, which is Tony G, um, that is an interesting style to play. It forces players to make mistakes and get mad at you. Or you can stay neutral and quiet like Gus Hansen, uh, which allows you to focus a lot better on what you're doing. Don't try to play a persona that you don't feel comfortable with doing. If, uh, if you're not a very, if you're an introverted person and not very in Intimidating, don't try to play an intimidating style or go against your natural personality. Um, each persona has an advantage and disadvantage. Uh, let's take Daniel Grigno style, a friendly persona. He treats other people's, people well. He is happy and talkative. He makes friends at the table. Um, he keeps a positive attitude. The advantages are you tend to have players talk towards you. I have seen some videos where players just tell him his hand, and it's just amazing. Um, tends to make players play soft at you because people like you. They don't want to upset you. They don't not want to be their friend, and it also shows at the table. Somebody's really nice to you at the table, and you're a jerk to him. It really looks bad to everybody else. And and you and in general, inside your mind, you don't want to look like a jerk at the table to all the other players. Uh, players tend to give you more information, and it keeps you positive. Uh, they will discuss stuff with you. 
You know, if you start saying, you know, you got this hand, so I'm going to throw it away. And he confirms it and he shows it to you. Um, Annie Duke does this kind of tactic. She's very flirtatious with players at the, at the table. And she has had people actually show them their hands while in the hand so she could properly fold. The disadvantages of this is it makes it focusing on the game a little bit more difficult because you're being more talkative. Um, so you got to balance the two. The next persona is the intimidating persona, which is uh, usually done by Tony G. Uh, Mike DeMouth kind of does it. Uh, the behavior is that you talk a lot, you insult people, you belittle people, um, you walk that fine line uh, that uh, what I call gets your red card or your yellow card in the poker game. Um, the advantages is <clears throat> are that it puts some players on tilt, makes other players play scared, and you have to identify the differences between the two. The scared players will fold more at you and play more predictable. The tilt players will try to make moves on you. Um, I think this type of style creates a lot of high variance, and you have to be very, very good at the game to do this kind of style. Um, players will be out to get you, and they will make mistakes. So when you have a big hand, you will cash big. Uh, and it also increases the chance that players will make mistakes in any form. But this is a very difficult style to play. The disadvantages are that it takes a lot of energy to do this, a huge amount. And it is a negative emotion, which uh, poorly impacts on your mental state because uh, you're always using negative terms. It increases variances as uh, variances players become unpredictable towards you. Um, but if you can handle it, it's you know a great style to do. The next one is a quiet persona or the neutral, which is Gus Hansen. Gus Hansen doesn't talk, doesn't speak, doesn't react to anything. He just sits there and he completely focuses on the hand and the game. And you know he still picks up reads on other players. But uh, the advantages are that it allows you better focus on the game. And you generally give off less tells. You're showing less emotion, you're giving off less tells. Uh, the disadvantages might be that you get bored. You're not talking to anybody, you're not interacting with anybody, you're just focusing on poker. Uh, you might fall asleep. Now we're going to move on to uh, the fun part, which are tells. Tells are the last thing that you should consider in a hand, but should be the first thing that you look at, even before you look at your cards or the board. And the reason is this, is that way you get an unbiased read on the player. You get a feel for them. Um, most men are visual learners. They, they see things and they remember them. Um, so when you look at somebody and you wait there for a few seconds to get a judgment on them, you'll remember that a lot easier than anything else. Um, after that, then you can look at the cards. Watch the player, not the board, uh, to get a read that is unbiased. Tells are given off by weak players much more reliably than they, than they are by strong players. Uh, this is, I think this is pretty obvious, maybe some of you don't know this, but everybody gives off tells. I don't care who you are, eventually you give off something due to stress, due to whatever, but people do give off tells. Strong players might give off a fake tell. Uh, understand the motive behind their action. This is one of the key, importance, uh, key important things in understanding tells and what a player is doing. Practice observation outside the poker room too. Sharpen your skills of observing what's going on around you. Use your peripheral vision to see all the action. Go to a mall, sit down, and just watch people and try to understand them. Try to understand their personalities, what they're doing, um, how they're reacting, why they're reacting. Uh, practice makes perfect. Phil Helmuth does this, uh, and he has said that it helps him a lot. I have done this, and it has helped me a lot too. Um, Online and younger players will give off more tells at a live game than an older player. Uh, with youth comes a better brain and a faster processor. With age comes experience. Uh, and this I find very true. Even older players at a live game, like let's say they're in their 50s or 60s, uh, I have a harder time getting tells off of them. Uh, stress and emotional players will definitely give off more tells. So keep an eye out for this. The tells I'm going to cover are going to be very generalized. I cannot do justice to the books I'm going to recommend because they cover things very specifically. But these are going to be, the following rules are going to be very uh, generalized so you can be at a table and look and look just for a, a pattern. We're going to start off with hiding tells. Record, your, if you can, which is pretty much in, very, very hard to do on, uh, at a live game, record yourself playing poker and see if you can identify your tells. Or, at worst, get a buddy to play at a table and you can play a low stake table and just watch each other. And just take notes on each other and what the time, and maybe you'll get a feel for what the hands are to see if you can find tells. Uh, when you're betting, use the same movement for betting or checking. Uh, this, uh, try to practice it. When betting, slide your chips, don't throw. I find that when I slide chips, I give off way more, way less tells 
than I do when I throw them because your throw can just be adjusted by slightly and give off information about your hand. Develop a robotic pattern for your play. Try to develop a style that you do, that just you do the same thing every hand over and over and over in a line of play. It might seem boring, but eventually you get used to it and just do something comfortable, but try to develop this pattern. Take time on each decision. Even let's say if you have a garbage hand in the hijack, still don't go to instantly fold it because you never know what's going to happen on your left. If you get something off the four players on your left that they're all going to throw away, that might be a stealing hand. Always take your time. Watch the players, not the cards. I said this before. I'm going to say this again. It's the most important thing. Watch the players first, not your cards. Don't look at cards until your turn. Um, watch everybody else looking at their cards. Watch the guys to your left as they peek at their cards. Watch everybody else. When, times get, when it comes to look at your cards, everybody's going to be looking at you. You're going to be better prepared to look at your hand and not give off any information. Um, my suggestion for most people is to keep their hands together within a hand when you're in a hand itself um, after you look at your cards that way you do your hands do not give any information away they're classed together they're steepled together whatever you're doing with them but keep them together don't play with your chips don't do anything because everything you do gives off information think of the right decision and not your hand strength uh, this is something just common to poker um, when it is another player's decision think of something happy if uh, you put somebody else to the test don't think about poker. Don't think about your hand. Think about something that just makes you happy. And that's uh, that'll help you avoid answering questions. And just focus on this happy moment. Be it your wife, be it your kids, be it the, the party you were at the night before. Think about that. And that'll keep you so focused on that event that you will not give off anything when somebody starts asking you questions or maybe being intimidating to you. I have tried this. It works beautifully. Use a practice pose that covers your neck and keeps your hands occupied. And the reason for this is that your body will give off tails whether you like it or not. Your pulse will give off, and some people, not me, but some other people, their pulses just pop out of their necks, pop out of their wrists, and you can identify this. Don't talk to other players. Uh, this goes back to don't talk to other players unless you have to, unless you have the last action. Just don't talk when you're in a hand. Reading tells. Player's state of mind may amplify his tells. When he's stressed or emotional, he'll give off more tells. Now, following are several different types of tells. First one are reactive tells. They are immediately to seeing the cards. As, as soon as somebody identifies the cards, identifies the flop, you're going to get something. Think of it this way. If it is your birthday and you completely forgot and you walk home and everybody pops out and says, surprise, that instantaneous reaction you have is the same reaction as a reactive tell. Acting tells. This occurs after the person has looked at everything, and has analyzed it, and digested it, and now comes the acting tells, where they're going to try to deceive you into what they have. This is judging his tell by the action, the situation, what the person wants you to believe. Um, hiding strength. Body chemicals give a hand strength away. Um, when you are excited, you just can't help it. Um, I've seen so many tournaments and so many games where a good player has aces and he gives off a chemical reaction tell. Uh, he builds up all this adrenaline and his hand starts shaking because he has aces and he is just overwhelmingly excited because there's a raise and a re-raise ahead of him. Um, Non-combat tells. Personal appearance and mannerisms. Again, this applies more to bad players and all this does. But this pretty much applies to bad players. How they dress and how they act will give you an indication on how they are. Player specific tells. These are very, very rare. Uh, things that you see in the movies, um, they're just not true. Uh, they are very specific and happen in very, very few players. When you do see them, yes, they are gems, and just about all the times they're in bad players. Fake tells. Strong players will display them. They will set you up for them. They will set you up over an hour or two with different hands just to nail you on a big one or a big bluff. Uh, comfort level is determined by their hand strength, and all these things interact together. And it takes quite a bit of time to develop your skills for reading people um, and, uh, and just applying and compressing all these things together and making a judgment. What usually happens is you go down a list of what the tells are and what the reads that you're going to get, and you see what's positive and what's negative, and that's going to lean you in one direction or another uh, if, if the tell that he's given off is one thing is strong or it's weakness. Let's look at reactive tells. 
positive responses, physical actions that expand out from the body or up from the body or toward their chips or toward the center of the table. These are reactive tells. Uh, these are positive tells, meaning they like what's going on. Uh, physical actions that bring players closer to the table, to the center of the table. They're more interested. Uh, think as if um, somebody comes up to you and they have a stack full of money and they're like, this is for you. Well, your natural instinct is like, oh, yes, thank you very much. You go over toward them, you extend your hand out, you smile, your eyebrows raise, you want that money. Now, if somebody comes over to you and uh, brings you a, uh, a can that's closed and said, there's dog poop in here, will you please take this? I'm going to open the lid. Your natural reaction is to frown, say, oh, no, and back away and put your, hand, and put your hands back and say, oh, I don't want it. So think of these kind of tells on this kind of level. When people are interested in their hands, they will go toward the center of the table. They'll rise up. Their feet will lift up. Um, their eyebrows will lift up. Um, they'll get excited. They'll go toward the action. When they don't like their hand, they'll go away from the action. Um, one very simple tell is when somebody likes their cards or not. If they don't like their cards, they'll nudge them away from them. If they do like their cards, they'll scoop them in closer. That's a very specific tell that applies to this. Um, yes type of responses are a very similar kind of thing, um, which apply to positive responses. Negative responses, physical actions that contract the body. Uh, or away from their chips. They don't They don't like their hand. They kind of like move back. They get distracted. Physical actions are bringing the players farther from the center of the table. They push away from the table. They try to get a drink. They look at the TV. These are all things that are negative responses. They're not paying attention anymore. Physical down responses. They slump, they slope, their eyebrows drop. Um, they frown, they purse their lips. These are all physical down responses. Disappointed or unhappy behavior. Another indication of we can't. And these all are applying to reactive tells instantaneously. No or uninterested type of responses. Same thing. Understand the differences, and this applies to reactive tells. Acting tells. This happens sometimes it's a second, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three. You have to gauge it by the player when this starts occurring. Um, strong means weak, and weak means strong. This is very basically true. People are trying to show you what they're trying to deceive you when they do this kind of tell. Acts of aggression or intimidation is a strong means weak. Uh, something, somebody that seems obviously interested in the pot or betting or their comfort, or their comfort level. Um, they're uncomfortable and they can't hold a complex conversation. I'm going to get into that for a second. Um, when they are interested in the pot or betting, they might grab their chips before it's their turn. Like if you're the first to act and they're second, they might grab their chips like trying to signal to you, I'm going to bet. And so to try to make you to check, this is a strong means weak tell. Or they start, or the, uh, uh, or if they put their money in the middle, they put it very obviously. They might grab a lot of little chips and put it in the middle to make their stack look bigger. These are all strong meek, means weak tells. Weak means strong. Um, acts of passiveness, disinterest in the pot. You know, if you see a player have a reactive tell, some of these eyebrows perk up when a flop comes, and then suddenly he's like ho hum and he starts looking at the TV. Um, this is an exact sign of. One tell is reactive. He got excited for the hand, and he's like, oh, I got a big hand. I got to deceive this guy, pretend that I don't have anything, and he acts very passive and uninterested. Uh, he's quiet. Usually quiet players have strong hands. Their comfort level. Now, this might seem counterintuitive, but when somebody's comfortable, they will talk about anything. They'll have a smooth voice. They have a big hand. Their hands will shake, but that's a, that's a physical reaction tell within inside of you. Um, and the reason for this is this. Let's talk about those two things. When somebody is bluffing, <clears throat> They're in a confrontation mode, and all they think about is like, will I get through this bluff? Uh, can I do it? You know, and that's all they're going to be focusing on. So they're not going to be able to hold the conversation. Um, it's kind of like waiting for a doctor's diagnosis to know if you have terminal cancer or not. You're just so nervous and so worried that you can't focus on anything. But on the other hand, if you have a strong hand, things change. Think about if you are at your favorite football game and your team is winning. You are super excited. But people could talk to you, and you'll be able to talk to them back very comfortably. Your team's winning. They're not going to lose. You could chat about anything you want. The person with the strong hand knows he's going to win the hand. He can be very comfortable. He might actually try to deceive you in his comfortable talking by saying different things. But it's important to note that when he is comfortable with his hand and by his body, that that is a sign of strength. Hiding strength. Nervousness and shaking hands are a sign of strength. This is all goes back to the chemical that is, that is activating your body when you have a big hand. You just can't help that kind of excitement. Players can't contain their excitement and their body reflected by releasing chemicals. A quiet man who has shaking hands 
has the nuts or close to it. So pay attention. Non-combat tells. Uh, this I find true not all the time, but generally. Appearances and mannerisms generally give clues to a player's general personality and player type, so observe and listen. A conservative type player will dress conservatively, organizes chips, usually stays quiet, and has introverted behavior. Um, I was at a live game where I had a gentleman like that to my left. He, uh, he didn't have a tie or anything like that, but he had a collared shirt, and it was buttoned up to the very top button, and he stood straight up on his chair. He sat very symmetrical, and uh, he was the nittiest person on the planet. I could steal his blinds left and right. Uh, and at the same time, on the other end of the table, we had a younger gentleman that had a lot of jewelry on. He had the shirt open way down. He had a very comfort posture in his chair, uh, comforting posture in his chair. He, he wore actually a purple shirt, and... He was a very loose, aggressive, bad player, and uh, and his chips were very disorganized. And this this was one of the few instances where these two type of um, appearances and mannerisms were very dynamic, uh, very opposite, and they were at the same table. But uh, it was an easy identifier. But you'll notice this in different in different types of players when you sit down, um, just their general appearances. If you go to a tournament or you go to a cash game, try to dress very neutral, not to give this kind of information away. Um, a loose gambling player is going to dress comfortable or flashy, uh, has piled chips, not organized chips, usually very talkative, and has extroverted behavior. Um, a lot of people can't help their personality. It's as simple as that. But always remember, these type of things apply to bad players or weak players, not strong players. Special tells. Specific tells are very rare. They rarely occur in live poker. It takes many observational trials to verify them, but they are very valuable when you do. Um, you have to and they are just about always in bad players. Uh, I knew a guy that every time he had a strong hand, he would say, I guess I bet. Every single time without exception. And when he had a weak hand, he wouldn't say anything. I had another player that every time he had a good hand, he would look at the flop. And when he didn't, he would look up at the, he would look up at the sky or look somewhere else. These are very specific tells, but very few that I have seen in my lifetime. Uh, but they are gold mines. But really don't rely on them. If by chance you start picking up a pattern, then you do. If you don't, that's fine. Stick to the standard tells. Fake tells. Only, usually only strong players will use them. It takes time to set up over many, many situations. And, it, and if you're going to set this up, don't try it on people that are just oblivious to what you're doing. The only players that you would try a fake tell on and to set it up would be a strong player. Comfort level tells. The less comfortable a player is, the weaker the hand. If you speak to a player, say a complex or surprising statement. Think before talking for what responses you want to get. If you want to determine somebody's comfort level, start talking to them. Daniel Negreanu is infamous for this. Do not say, are you bluffing? That's a yes or no answer that requires a millisecond of his process time, and you're not going to get anything of this. But if you ask a question that requires complexity, it might impact him so much that he might give something off, like even look to one side or another which is a form of a tell. A where a player's look is determining how he's thinking. To one side, he's thinking with his emotional and creative side. To the other side, he's thinking with his mathematical side. Um, and it depends on the player. Most players are right-brained. I mean, most players are right-handed, so their brain will, will, uh, will uh, act a certain way. Some other players are other-handed. Uh, I actually forgot what the exact brain type is. You might want to look that up. When you ask a complex question or a surprising one, um, just ask sometimes something crazy and you'll get a reaction. Like, um, you know, what kind of ice cream do you like? You know, do you, do you prefer, do you prefer olive, flavor, olive, olive flavor, uh, flavored ice cream or do you prefer strawberry? And if they give you like a strange look, like what are you talking about? That is actually a form of a tell, that they're comfortable in giving you that kind of a look. Uh, but it depends on the player. I've actually used that kind of statement before and got like a perplexity, and the guy's like, what are you talking about? And I could tell right then and there the guy was comfortable, and he had a strong hand. Um, so if you ask a question, ask something complex. Don't say something simple. Ask something that requires them to think about it, and you might be able to get something off of them. Let's go to the summary of psychology. Be observant to your surroundings and your people in and off the table. Gain as much information about others. Let them talk. Do not do the talking let them talk. Ask them questions that will draw more information about them. Remember that people love talking about themselves, especially men. Do not reveal any information about yourself, nothing about what you do. Um, if people ask you about your profession, you know, try to say, you know, I've done sales, I've done technical, I've done a lot of things. Um, try to keep it generalized. Don't give them any information about 
what you do because what you do in life also gives a little bit of information about how you think. Understand the benefits and detriments of your persona. Play something that you feel comfortable with and you know how to exploit it. Look for tells first, but use them as a last decision. Now, I know I didn't cover this before in much detail, but you consider everything else first. Betting patterns, uh, mathematics, um, everything before you look at tells. Tells are usually applied to that 50-50 situation, like is this guy bluffing or is this guy not bluffing? Um, that's when you usually apply tells. Um, or even as something as simple as you look to the people to your left to see if they're folding out. But it's in, in very small situations, most of the time, not in huge pots. Very rarely it is in huge pots. Uh, reactive tells act instantaneously, and a positive response means a strong hand. Acting tells happen after they have time to think and digest the hand. A strong response equals a weak hand. So remember, they're trying to deceive you. Um, speak to gain comfort level tells. Comfortable people have strong hands. They're not worried about anything. Bluffing people are worried. They're not going to be able to hold a conversation. Now, notice that this is interesting because acting tells when they're weak, they're going to try to act strong. They're trying to deceive you, but they still can't hold the conversation. Um, actions that are directed toward the table, up or expanding, indicate strong hands in a reactive tell. Actions away, down, or contracting indicate weak hands in a reactive tell. Nervousness is usually strength. These are very, very basic things that you could look for without getting into specifics. Like I said, I can't do justice to the books that I read. Here are the list of recommended books that I would suggest uh, for yourself and if you play live. Elements of Poker by Tommy Angelo, very excellent book. Ace on the River by Barry Greenstein, this is the one that really helped me understand how I should play. Tao of Poker, Poker Gaming, Poker Gaming and Life by Sklansky and Mason Malmuth, Inside the Poker Mind by John Feeney, and The Psychology of Poker by David Sklansky. Psychology of Poker might be a little bit outdated. I haven't read it in a while, but I still think it was a good read. Uh, these all, <clears throat> some of them apply to playing at the table, uh, but all of them definitely apply to yourself. Different books will have different impacts on you. For me, Ace on the River and Elements of Poker were the ones that really impacted me well. The other ones, not so much. Um, not as much, I should say. Uh, so you have to figure out exactly which one will make that light spark up in your head. Books on body language and tells. <clears throat> Mike Carroll's Book of Poker Tells. I don't care how many times people say it looks cheesy. This book paid for itself on the first night. This, this book basically teaches you a lot of the acting tells that people give off and some of the uh, reactive tells. At the time that Carroll wrote the book, and I don't know if the newer version is updated, um, I don't think he, distinct, he was very distinct enough between reactive and acting tells, but just keep that in mind. Read Him and Reap by Joe Navarro. Uh, Marvin Carlins and Phil Helmuth. Uh, this focuses on a lot of tells, uh, a lot of reactive tells, um, but between the two you'll get a distinction between the two and you'll see what is what. Both those books are excellent on tells and they are very dead accurate to players. I have read them and reread them if you play live games. Just recently I found a tell that I have never seen before while observing two other people in a hand and the tell was accurate. And that is it. And uh, that is the end of the slideshow. And uh, I forgot to say that at the end. So I hope you enjoyed my video. And um, maybe you'll vote for me. Thanks a lot.